Have you ever been ghosted before? Maybe you've done something, you sinned against the individual, you betrayed that individual, you did that individual wrong, maybe you're in a relationship, marriage, and you committed adultery, and now you're worried about being ghosted, left alone, kicked to the curve. That's not a good feeling. Today in our passage, Judah, Israel, feels as though they're being ghosted by God or will be ghosted by God. That because of their past sins, God's going to have nothing to do with them. In fact, God's going to leave them in their misery. Stay tuned and see if God actually ghosts his people or not. It's going to be a great lesson. See you in a few minutes. Hello, my name is Reverend Dr. John W. Wilson III, bringing you the Sunday School lesson for this Sunday, January the 8th. I want to thank you for joining me on today. I hope everybody's new year has started off right. I hope wherever goals that you make, that you will work hard to achieve them. And I hope one of them is to continue watching this Sunday School lesson each and every week. Thank you so much in advance. Remember, before we get started, I'd like you to hit like, share or subscribe spread this uh, lesson if you think it's beneficial to many people as possible uh, this past year 2022 i've seen tremendous growth in this channel and it's up to you i need your help thank you so much in advance so let's get right into our lesson our lesson is titled god promises to restore god promises to restore comes out of the book of isaiah major prophet chapter 43 we'll look at verses 1 through 4 and then we'll move over to 10 through 12. sounds like short verses but it's a lot packed in there and as we will soon find out so what do we know about the book of isaiah what do we know about isaiah isaiah was a uh, seventh century prophet or eighth century prophet his uh, prophecy started you look at isaiah chapter 6 under King Uzziah, that was about 740 BC. It lasted a very long time, maybe 60, 70, 80 years, very long prophecy. Uh, he prophesied under many different kings. Uh, he was, uh, when, he was, when he was prophesying, he prophesied to the southern kingdom. The northern kingdom had been destroyed by Assyria and during his prophecy, uh, his uh, the, the southern kingdom was being besieged by Assyria also. Uh, the southern kingdom did not get destroyed. The city of Jerusalem, the capital city, was not taken over. But it just about everything else was destroyed by the Assyrian army. And what stopped them, if you remember, is that about, a, oh, thousands of, tens of thousands of army soldiers, maybe 80,000, might have been more than that, were camped out, ready to besiege Jerusalem, and God sent a death angel, killed all his troops, and then the king, uh, uh, then the king called the commander back, and that was the end of that. So, uh, Isaiah, major prophet. I mean, this book is really broken up in three parts. If you look at chapter one to thirty-nine, he's preaching or speaking primarily to his contemporaries, the ones that are dealing with this. Assyrian besiege. And then if you look at uh, chapters 40 to 45, remember this, he's speaking into the future, about a hundred years into the future of what's gonna happen. Uh, and he's gonna, we'll get into that a little later, but he's gonna foretell or prophesy what's gonna happen to the people of Judea, Israel. And you gotta remember the biggest plague that Northern Kingdom had as well as the southern kingdom had, was idolatry that, and worshiping different gods. And really, uh, they came out of Egypt really worshiping idols and things of that nature, even before that, 
but they really weren't able to ever shake that off. And this led to their exile in Babylon. So we know about that. That began, the exile in Babylon began in, uh, began in 597 BC. 597 BC, the Northern Kingdom was destroyed or conquered or just wiped out in 721 BC. So uh, about 120 years later, uh, we're going to, uh, the Judah the, is going to be taken into exile. And so Isaiah is preaching into the, uh, into the future. He is seeing what happened to the Northern Kingdom. He's seeing what is happening to the Southern Kingdom. And then when we look at chapters 56 through 66, Isaiah is preaching to those who are returning from captivity, those from the southern kingdom uh, who are no longer in exile, who have been given the permission to return home from by King Cyrus. So those are the three parts, but the part that we're going to work on today, since we're in chapter 43, is Isaiah speaking 100 years into the future to those who will be in captivity. And the passage that we have today it's going to be a message of hope, uh, of encouragement through difficult times, that God has not forgot about them, and that God will restore them even though they betrayed him. God is not going to ghost anybody, okay? That's the message that Isaiah is giving to those people in a hundred years. So, let's get into our, our lesson. Uh, one thing that stood out to me in this background is that how the Babylonian uh, nation or army came to know about Israel. And I believe it was King Hezekiah invited some people, an envoy from Babylon to come visit them while they were freed and all that. And he, he made the mistake of showing them their fabulous treasure in Solomon's temple. And so God did not like that. And then he, Isaiah prophesizes that it will be the Babylonian army that comes back and conquers them and puts them in captivity. And uh, one thing we learned from that is that just because God has blessed you doesn't mean that you should be boasting about it and you can show your blessings to anybody because it can bring schemers and scammers. They can bring the enemy upon you and you really have no one to blame yourself. And that's what happened here. Show too much. They went back and told whoever was uh, king that time remembered it. And at the appropriate time, they came back and laid the siege against Judah or Israel. All right. So let's look at 43 uh, before we get there. Uh, when we look at verses 18 through 25, uh, God, is, through Isaiah, is laying out the reasons why they're going to be punished in exile by Babylon. They're going to lay out the reasons. And the reason is because they have been given the law, they have been given prophets, they have been given a glorious history, and yet they still disobey God. They still rejected the law, they still worship false idols. Uh, they still lived evil ways, and God has had enough. And one thing you can say is this. Was it not the Lord whom we have sinned, in whose ways they would not walk? They didn't walk in the ways of God, in the commandments and the statutes. It says, and whose law they would not obey, would not obey the law. The law was designed to help them become a holy people. It couldn't and look for a Messiah. It was the law was to tell them the right way of living. And so they would not obey the law. They did the exact opposite. It says, so he poured on him the heat of his anger and the might of battle. It set him on fire all around, but he did not understand. It burned him up, but he did not take it to heart. So really disobedience is what led to the destruction. Disobedience was led to the destruction of the northern kingdom. You would think that they would learn from their big brothers up north about what God could do. But somehow, sometimes when you're called the chosen people or when you have a special relationship with God, or even when you're a Christian, you can think that you can live any kind of way 
and God would allow it simply because you are a child of his. And although God will continue to love you uh, and not forsake you, there will be consequences of your actions. And this is what happens here. And this is what we can learn in our life. As Christians, many times we say, oh, God will forgive you. Oh, God will forgive you. And maybe he will. I said this last week. Maybe he will. But uh, maybe he won't. Uh, depends. If it's not sincere, I, I can't see any forgiveness. But there are consequences of your actions. Although you may be forgiven, the consequences remain. Does it mean that God is doing something to you? No. Sometimes you just read what you saw. Sometimes the consequences are just natural of the, of the things that you're engaged in. And sometimes we like to blame God, but really it's just reaping what you sow. That's all it comes down to. Now, does God ever come in and punish? Yes, he does. Could God keep us from being punished? Yes, he does. But sometimes God lets us have our way, and that includes the consequences that go with it. And this is what happened here. They have sinned. They have been disobedient. They have turned against God. And now in 100 years, they have found themselves, they will find themselves in exile in Babylon in harsh and cruel treatment. But this is a message of hope, okay? Uh, 43, as we come to 43, what God, what God is saying through Isaiah, although you have sinned, although you're being punished, I have not forgot about you, okay? Uh, there is still something to look forward to. You are still my people. Uh, I'm still right there with you, even through the difficult times that you're about to face. I am there. Uh, it's, so this is this 43 is going to try to counteract the negative news that the that the Jewish people are hearing about the future, and that the Jewish people a hundred years from now will experience. And he's counteracting that by giving them a message of hope, a word of encouragement. He's not going to make it peachy cane, but he's going to make some promises that we're going to find out that will let them know that God is right there with them. And although you're going through what you're going through, he has not forsaken you. He has not ghosted you. You are still his people. Uh, God does not ghost his people. He does not ghost children of God. It may feel, excuse me, it may feel like that uh, because when you're caught up in sin and you're being punished or you're reaping your consequences, uh, sometimes you feel all alone. You feel by yourself. You have a pity party. Uh, you feel no one's here and listening to you. Uh, you know that you're going to be punished for a long time. So it feels like God is not there and God is saying, I am there. So let's look at verse 1. So 18 through 25 lays out the charges against him, the reasons why. And then verse 1 begins in the ESV with a conjunction. But now, thus says the Lord, but now. Thus says the Lord. God is speaking to them in a different way. It says, He who created you, O Jacob. Okay? That gives the idea of when God created the heavens and earth. God created them. It wasn't by accident. It was on person, it was on purpose. It was intentional. So God is saying, O Jacob, because says, O Jacob, uh, Jacob and Israel are interchangeable. And he's using names. And that indicates, I know you, are relationships. He says, but now, thus says the Lord, he who created you, okay? Uh, you got to remember, Israel did not become a nation until it came out of the Exodus. Then it was a nation of people. God created the nation of Israel like he created the heavens and earth with a purpose, with intentionality, with a plan in mind. They were supposed to be the light of the world, to tell people how good their God was to attract people to serve in their God. So God created them with a purpose. He says, oh, Jacob, he who formed you, meaning that I made you who you are. You went through tough battles. You went through this. You went through that. And I formed you to the people you are today, the nation you are today. He says, and uh, meaning that uh, he who formed you, oh, Israel. God is, is still, what, it, what that really means that God is making you out of nothing. He is shaping you into something 
for a particular purpose. So he's reminding them what he's done for them. And created and formed can be uh, 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 interchangeable. They basically say the same thing. And then he says, because I have created you, like I did the heaven and earth, because I have formed you like a baby in the womb of a mother, shaped you, made you into what you are, uh, the prophets, the, the personal relationship, all those made you into my chosen people. He says, fear not. Just because you're in this bind, you are in captivity. Captivity is going to happen. Fear not. He says, I have redeemed you. What he's saying that fear not. I haven't ghosted you. I haven't forgotten about you. I haven't kicked you to the curb. I haven't left you alone. I haven't abandoned you. He says, fear not. You're not in there by yourself. For I have redeemed you. Redeem means I have saved you. I have brought you out of something. I have purchased you out of something. And what he's telling them is that in the midst of your difficulties, and this is for us today, in the midst of our, whether we did something or not, whether it's going through a trial, or we, or we suffer the consequences for our sin, and we're going through it, and it's difficult, and it's hard, harder than what we thought, paying a price that we did not expect to pay, fear not. For I have redeemed you. God is saying it will not last forever. Uh, I'm not through with you yet. Uh, even though you have betrayed me, done me wrong, or disobeyed my law, diso did not follow my commandments. Even though I still have a plan for you. And so I don't know, I don't know what your story is. I don't know what you've done or what you haven't done. Uh, we've all done some things where we feel are worthy of God abandoning us. And God said, if you are a child of mine, if you're authentic and you're a child of mine, guess what? Fear not. I have redeemed you. Now, I'm going to go through some tough times, but I have redeemed you. Okay? I have called you by name. When he says, I have called you by name, that means relationship. When you call somebody by name, Jacob, Israel, relationship, commitment, it means you are mine. I called you by name. You are mine. When I call you by name, I gave you an identity. I gave you purpose. I had a plan for you. You are mine, I meaning I have ownership of you. Okay? I have authority over you. That's important. When God calls you by name, He is setting you apart for a particular purpose. When He calls you by name and says you are mine, he has a plan for your life. If you are a child of God today, God has called you by your name. He knows your name. He has named you and you are his. So even if you find yourself in a terrible situation, a difficult situation, maybe you have sinned, maybe you have done this, maybe you have done that, and you think there's no hope, remember God knows your name. In fact, he called you by name and you are his, and he's not, he's not going to, that will always be true, even when it doesn't feel like it, okay? So he's reestablishing with Israel, who will be in captivity, that hey, even though you're suffering, even though you're doing this, even though you're done wrong, you are still mine. I've called you by your name. I called you by name. You are still mine. That gives hope. Because they're going to go through 70 years of captivity. And that 70 years is not going to be an easy 70 years. They're going to witness murder, killings. They're going to witness the temple being destroyed. They're going to be carted off from Jerusalem to Babylon, which is modern day Iraq. They're going to be forced to adapt another culture, speak a different language, adjust to a different customs and food and all those kind of things. And on top of that, be oppressed by a foreign nation. And then what's going to be left behind in Jerusalem is going to be everything's going to be burned up, left in rubble. And the people that did not go with them will be in utter poverty. They're going to see some things. And they're going to wonder, has God really left me? And God's reassuring that I have not left you. You are important to me. You were not created by accident. 
You are not formed without a purpose. Okay? And so, he says, you are mine. And, and uh, God has, has a glorious past with Israel. He brought them, uh, he started with Abraham, uh, from Abraham, uh, that that's their father of the faith. He brought them out of 400, over 400 years of slavery in Egypt. He made them a nation. He gave them a promised land to conquer. God has done great things. And what we have to do is that when we feel like we have sinned and there's no return, remember the great things that God has done for us. Remember what he's brought us through. And remember that God loves you. God is not forsaking you. God is not ghosting you. And that the time that you may have in this captivity, it's a time to reflect. Reflect on what you may have done wrong or what you did do wrong or reflect upon what God expects of you. Obedience. Look at your behavior. Look at your relationship with God. Look at what led to that situation. If, in fact, you've done something, if you're in a trial, Ask what God, God, what do you what do you want from me? What do you want me to learn from this? But whatever the case is, take this time to learn about God as much as you can and what plan he has for your life. God can take someone who was, I was uh, uh, listening to a radio program. There was a minister, a sharp minister. He had been in uh, prison over a quarter uh, of his life. And God has raised him up to be a minister, to be a pastor, to be a congressman in his local city, to be on a very popular podcast, and to be imparted with wisdom and the ability to speak well. God, God did not forsake this individual. If God can do it for him, God can do it for you, and he can do it for me. And that's comforting. Okay? Verse 2, look what God says. When you pass... Not if, but when you pass through the waters, I will be with you. When you pass through waters that seem like they're above your head, okay, where you seem like you're going to drown, when you pass through the waters, that means when you pass through many difficult times, okay? And the key word is pass. So when you go through many difficult times, hardships, loss of a loved one, death, illnesses, financial problems, sin that seems to be devastating. When you go through the waters, guess what? That may, When you pass through the water, God, I mean, God has not destroyed you. It says pass through the water. That means no matter what you're going through, you will get through it. What you're going through is temporal. It will pass no matter what it is. As you, if you change your ways, your, your disobedience to obedience. You learn to not trust yourself, but to trust God. To lean on his word, to lean on him. Guess what? When you pass through the waters, God says, I will be with you. Meaning that I will, you're not saving yourself, but I'm there carrying you through the difficulty that you're going through. Isn't that reassuring? He's telling the people that will be in captivity under tremendous amounts of hardship, like it's a slavery, uh, even more than that, this tremendous hardship. God says that will pass, it's temporary, and in order that I know it will pass because I'm going to be with you. He's talking to a nation of people. He said, he said Israel, you will not be destroyed. You will not be taken out. I will be there right with you to make sure that you pass through the water. That's what he does for you and for me. Whatever you may go through, it will pass. The waters will subside. Not because of you, not because of a doctor, not because of money, not because of that. Simply because you are a child of God and God is with you. That's powerful. That's reassuring. Okay. Then it says, and through the rivers, they shall not overwhelm you. A lot of times we get in a situation where we feel like we're overwhelmed. And God says, when you feel overwhelmed, don't look at your situation. Look at me. If you keep your eyes on God, the maker of heaven and earth, the alpha and the maker and everything in between, then you know there's no situation or difficulty that's too big for God. Keep your eye, whatever you're going through, when you go through the waters and the waters are above your head and you can't breathe, 
Don't feel overwhelmed. Keep trusting God and watch what God will do. Remember, God says, I will be with you. And he's telling the people through Isaiah that it's going to be difficult through these times. It is not going to be easy. It will be difficult. But don't be dismayed. Fear not. I am with you. He says, when you walk through fire, you shall not be burned. That gives a military presence, how they burn down. When you conquer a village or a town or a city, they would burn them down. He says, when, when, that if, when you walk through fire, when you come through a fiery furnace, when you're surrounded by hardship, when you're, tired, when you're being conquered, when you're being mistreated, you shall not be burned. You will not be destroyed. Isn't that good to know? And this is God saying it. And no other God can say this. This is the maker of heaven and earth. This is the giver of life. This is the person who holds the whole world in their hands. He's making a promise to the people of Israel that their nation will not be ghosted. They will not be uh, torn down and decimated like other nations. They will survive this hard hardship because God is with them. God will be their protector and their provider. What they need to do is keep focus on God. Okay? Trust Him and He will get them through the life's most difficult situations. That's what we need to know. And the flame will not consume you. God has given the word that it will get hot. Uh, you will feel the heat. But you will not be burned. And that flame will not consume you. You'll be in a, you're going to be in some hot situations. As a nation, God still has plans for you. He's not ghosting you, Israel. He's right there with you. Okay? And he says, the reason why I can say this. The reason why I can make these promises, second half of verse 2, for I am the Lord your God. I am the Lord, the ruler, the authority, your God. I am Je Jehovah, your God. Meaning that I am the only God that's there. Everybody else that claims to be God or everything is a fake God. All the idols you worship, they're fake, they're not real. There's only one true God. And I am the Lord your God, the one and only true God. That's why I can say and promise what I do and make it happen. Because I am the Lord your God. So when you go through tough times, then you will, and I will, lean on the I am the Lord your God. Lean on the I am the Lord your God. Lean on God. Lean on the one and true God. Don't get caught up in fake gods. Don't get caught up in cults. But lean on the one and truly God. That's where your salvation comes. That's where your redemption comes from. That's where your, del <coughs> your deliverance comes from. That's where your comfort comes from. Okay? That's powerful stuff. I am the Lord your God, the Holy One, Holy, Almighty, All Powerful, perfect in all ways. Okay? No other God can say, I am the Holy One, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. I am Lord your God. I am the Holy One of Israel. I am your rescuer. I am the one that will bring you salvation. I can do that because I'm the one true living God. And the reason why Isaiah is impressing this upon them is because during the day in which he's doing this, they are worshiping idols, wooden idols, stone idols. They are mixing different religions together. They're doing all these things and he's trying to speak to the people today, his contemporaries, as well as speak to the people who will find themselves in captivity because over the next hundred years, they would not stop worshiping these false idols. He's trying to encourage them to put those idols away 
and worship the one true living God, Jehovah. And that's what we got to do today. We got our false idols too, our money, our car, the house, our status, our privilege, all those things. We have got to put those things away and worship the one true living God because no matter what situation we find ourselves in, the only one that can save us, that can redeem us, the only savior that we have that can rescue us is the one true living God. And God wants obedience from us. He wants us to keep his statutes. He wants us to trust him. Okay? All right. It says, uh, I'm the, I'm, uh, I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. I give Egypt as your ransom, Cush and Seba in exchange for you. He says, God says, I love you so much, Israel. I haven't ghosted you, haven't kicked you to the curb, haven't forgot about you. I love you so much that I'll give anything for you. I'll give all of Egypt for you. I'll give Egypt as your ransom, meaning that I will, I will, I will if you get you back to me. I will give away Egypt. Not only will I give Egypt away, I will give Cush and Seba away in exchange for you. I mean, there's no limit to what I will do for you to restore you and bring you back to my fold. That's what he's saying. And then when he verifies it by this, because you are precious in my eyes. Whatever the ransom is, whatever I need to pay, whatever I need to do to bring you back, I will do that. And God says that today. He says it through Jesus Christ. I've loved you so much. I've given the most valuable thing I had, which was my son. I sent him to die on the cross for your sins because I want to have a relationship with you. I want to be in right relationship with you. God loves us so much. He's willing to pay any price for our salvation. That's what he's saying here. Because, Israel, you are precious in my eyes. You are valuable in my eyes. If you have self-esteem issues, you should not. You and I are precious in the eyes of God. And if you and I are precious in the eyes of God, what else matters? Who else matters? What matters most in life is being precious in the eyes of God. That makes you and I a 10 on God's scale. Doesn't mean we're perfect. Doesn't mean anything. But we are a 10 simply because we are precious in God's eyes. And look how he backs this up. Because you are precious in God's eyes and honor, God values us. Okay? We are important to Him. And I love you. The reason why we are precious in God's eyes, the reason why we are valued by God, is not because of who we are, it's not because of what we do. Remember, this is Israel. They have a sinful past. Look at you and me. We have a sinful past. We can't do anything to warrant the love of God, the, the respect of God. We are, we are depraved. We are sinful individuals. This was a sinful nature. And God's saying the reason why that we're precious and the reason why we're honored is simply because he loves us. And that's enough. I'm so glad that God loves us. I'm so glad that we don't have to try to work our way to earn God's love or to work our way to get God's favor. I'm so glad that God's love overlooks our past, overlooks our sin through Jesus Christ. And he loves us so much that he's willing to pay any type of ransom, including his only begotten son, so that those who believe would have everlasting life and be in right relationship with him throughout eternity. That's how much God loves. That's how much God's loving them. Can you imagine? <coughs> excuse me. Can you imagine being in captivity? You're at your lowest point. You lost everything that you've had. 
It's been taken away. It's been destroyed. Your family's been separated. You've seen your kids being killed. You've seen your parents being killed. You've seen your friends, your siblings being killed. And God says this. You are precious in my eyes and I, and I love you. God said, I haven't ghosted you. I have never stopped loving you. Okay? You have never stopped being precious in my eyes. You have never stopped being valued in my eyes. Look what he says. I'll give, I give men in return for you. Peoples in exchange for your life. He reiterates what he said. I'll do anything to get you back. Give up any person to get you back. Simply because I love you. Self-esteem problems, read this passage. Believe it. Trust it. God loves you. And because he loves us this much, we ought to live an obedient life. We ought to be able to, to get rid of any idols that's keeping us from God or worshiping him completely. Simply because he loves us in spite of ourselves. We are not lovable. Israel was not lovable. But God loved us anyway. And only a God like him can love, can love like that. If it's up to us, as soon as somebody done us wrong, we ghost them. As soon as somebody done us wrong, we try to get them back. We try to hurt them. But God, in the midst of this punishment, he's trying to purify the people that he loves. He has great plans for the people of Israel. Okay? All right, so we look at five through, let's go five through seven. The people there are wondering, okay, what's going to happen to our people? What's going to happen to our nation? Okay, are we going to ever have a nation again? And five through seven, God says, I'm going to send people all from all parts of the world, east, west, north, and south. They will come and populate the nation of Israel. I have not forgot about that. They will come from the far. They'll come from the ends of the earth. Though everyone who's called by my name, who I deem to be my child, will come. Everyone I created for my glory, everyone that I have formed, they will make up this nation. Your nation will be restored. And God keeps his promises. Look at the nation of Israel today. Restored. Look at what it will be in the future. All the descendants of Abraham, all the believers. It will be restored. It has been restored. Okay? Then verse 8 uh, through 12 uh, talks about something else. It talks about it makes an attack against the false gods that the people of Israel were worshiping. And that they have an inability to predict the future, let alone make things happen. Only the one truly, true living God can proclaim something, make it happen, and make others see it and hear about all what he's done. Okay, he's challenging them. Bring on your gods. Bring on those false idols. See what they can do. See if they can predict the future. See if they can uh, have a testimony of what their God has done and see what their God has done has been true or not? And the answer is no. And then in verse 10, God says, part of our passage today, talk to the nation of Israel. You are my witnesses, declare the Lord, and my servant who I have chosen. Servant would he be here with me, nation, who I have chosen. You didn't choose me, I chose you. That means you are a special people to God. I mean, God has chosen you to be set apart, to do something special, to be part of his kingdom plan. Okay? All right? It wasn't because you were good. God says, I chose you. He says, I chose you that you may know and believe me and understand that I am he, that I am the one true living God. I am the God that can make, that can say it, and make things happen. I can predict the future and I can make it happen and then I can have it be proclaimed for others to see. That's what he's saying here. He says, I chose you 
okay, to be my witnesses, to be my servant, that you may know and believe me. See, God wants the nation of Israel to know, and he wants us to know, is that know what you believe, and then know why you believe, and then make sure you have a relationship with the God Almighty. See, the nation of Israel, they may, they may know what they believe, but I don't know if they knew why they believed it. And then I don't know if they knew the importance of putting what they believe and why they believe into action. And what we got to do as Christians and what God is calling us to do is that God wants us to know and believe him. Know him in an intimate way. So much so that we trust him and that we understand how great he is and what a privilege, privilege it is to worship and be under a God like him. If we knew that and we understood it, nothing would come in the way between God and us. There would be no idols. There would be no money issue. There would be no, I love the car more than God. There would be none of that. If we truly understood who God was, knowledge, truly believed it, and truly recognized that he, that, that he is the one truly God, the Lord thy God, we'd be much better off. And somehow the people of Israel lost track of who God really was. Maybe they thought he was a cosmic genie that gave them everything they want. Maybe they thought that they could have a one-way relationship with God where they disobey God, but God still was always there for them. And that no catastrophe would ever come upon them. Maybe they took God for granted. Maybe they just forgot about God and just worshiped him in name only. Somehow they lost track. And God says, no, I want you to know, know me, believe me, and understand who I really am. If you understood who I really am, you would need no one else. Okay? It says, before me, no God was formed. He said, before me, there was no, no God before me. There's no God after me. There, nor should there be any after me. I mean, now all those things that you are worshiping, they're fake. They're not real. There's only one God, period. You can call, call something a God. That doesn't make it a God. And yeah, look at it. A God is only one God. There's only one supreme being. And God is saying, that's who I am. Okay? There was nobody before and there's nobody after. They said, look what he says right here. I, I am the Lord and besides me there's no Savior. Salvation is through me only. Only I can get you out of your situation. I am the Lord. No one else is the Lord. No one else can rescue you. No one else can give you eternal life. That's what God is saying. It's like he's speaking to a stubborn people. But sometimes when you're in a captivity, when you're being oppressed, guess what? You hear a little better, and you see a little better, and you act a little better. And that's what Isaiah is counting on. And that's what's going to happen to the people. Because when they come out of exile, after 70 years, there's no issue with idol worship anymore. No more issue. You don't hear about it anymore. Sometimes God has to take us through things to refine us. I declare and save and proclaim. I am God who de declares what the future is. I am the God whose ability to save and make things happen. I am the God who is to be proclaimed. When there was no strange gods among you and you, were in, you, were, you, and you are my witness, declares the Lord, I am God. Look at the things I've done for you. Brought you out of Egypt. Fought your battles. Defeated your enemies. Blessed you. Gave you from matter from heaven. Populated you. Gave you the promised land. Allowed you to build Solomon's temple. The greatest temple there ever was. I've done all these things for you. It says, I and I am God. And witness means... You have a testimony. You can testify to the great things that I've done, 
Just look at your history. Look at the great things. And our daughter declares the Lord because I am God and there's no other. If we can live our life knowing that you and I can do great things for the Lord. There is no other God. I am God. I am the Lord thy God. I am the Lord your God. That means I don't care what the people think. I don't care what the politicians think. I don't care what my boss thinks. I don't care what my family thinks. I'm going to worship you and obey you because you are the one true living God. And I, 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 I know it and I believe it and I understand it to the best of my ability. Powerful stuff here. What an encouraging word to people who will find themselves in captivity. What an encouraging word to the people who are living during the time of Isaiah right now who knows something bad is coming. They have an opportunity to change their life right now. What an encouraging word to you and I some thousands of years later that if we get on board with God, honor God for who he is, recognize him for who he is, our life can be changed completely. The world can be a better place. Well, I hope this lesson has been good to you. Um, it's been fantastic to me. Uh, just so powerful. I, I just feel a sense of urgency about putting God, making sure God is number one in my life each and every day, each hour, each minute, each second. God is number one. How I treat people how I treat my siblings, how I treat my spouse. Treat them in a way that reflects that God is number one. How I obey, how live a life in a way that reflects that God is number one in your life. And he's the Lord your God. And he is, I am God. Live a life that reflects that. Don't worry about God ghosting. You may have some ups and downs, but God will never ghost you. He's always right there. He will carry you through the difficult times. He still has plans for you. I don't care who you are, no matter what. He has plans for you. If you're living, breathing, sound mind, He has plans for you. God bless you. Love you much. Hope you have a great Sunday. Hope you have a great Sunday school. Love you much. We'll talk again next week.